from this subject, Jesus Christ, the true vine. I am the true vine. Father, bless us now as we preach the word. May we do no damage to the word, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. I am the true vine. Before I preach this message to you, I want to give you the intent and the goal of this message um, from the start. The goal of this message has two components, and I want you to hear me. And both components are of immense value. And neither can we as believers live without these two components. They are listed in order, and they are listed in the order of their importance, although both are of great value and both have lifelong as well as eternal benefits and consequences. In this world of wall to wall, conflicting and confusing COVID coverage. You know, I wanna, Brother Dooley, I wanna show them the, the headlines uh, from Israel. Uh, the American media, media uh, won't show you this, but I want to show you something. Now, isn't this something? Leading Israeli health officials. Here's, here's what they are saying. Vaccinated accounts for 95% of severe and 85 to 90% of the new COVID hospitalizations. Vaccine effectiveness is really fading. Now this is an article uh, written by the Gateway Pundit and um, they're talking about what's going on and, and the funny thing is now the American media will never show you this and uh, I hope Facebook don't take me down for showing it to you. They may but I'm just reporting what's in the news. Now, I, I'm not in Israel, I'm in Raleigh. I, I don't know what's going on, but this is what is being reported. Now, Israel is ahead of us in vaccinations. They're ahead of us. And I find it, first of all, let me say, whatever your status is, whether you're vaccinated or not, that's your business. I have never asked but one person on this planet whether or not they were going to take the shot. And that was my mother. I asked her. And she answered me. Uh, well, what did she tell you? She answered me. <laughs> now, if you want to know what she said, you can ask her. Uh, she'll tell you. Anyway. It's, there's no one else on the planet because I feel, uh, I, I, I still, I, I feel that things like that, uh, uh, they're people's uh, personal business, number one. You know, uh, now when it came down to AIDS, the HIPAA laws, oh my, they've been fiercely, uh, they were fiercely enforced. But now they seem to just Throw that out the window now. So you wonder what happened. We're being selective with laws that we want to enforce. I mean, I said earlier that it was 19, 1937, but it was 1947, the Nuremberg Code. 
says the voluntary consent of human subjects is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be situated as to be able to experience free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, overreaching, so forth and so on. You're not supposed to be able to tell people you can't travel, you can't enter into a restaurant, you can't work, you can't fly a plane, you can't do any of these things unless you take the shot. This has been in place since 1947. And yet people, now mind you, my position is not that you shouldn't or that you should. My position is that's up to you. But, but everybody ought to feel some kind of way about the way now they are forcing people, telling athletes you can't play unless you take the shot. You can't hardly even fill out uh, a paper to go to a conference without answering a question that the Nuremberg Code and the HIPAA law say they have no right to ask. And yet they're asking these things to put pressure on people. There's something wrong with that. I keep asking myself, is this America? Is this America? And the thing that gets me is whereas they're putting pressure on citizens to do this, the government, the same government refuses to close the border where they're letting people into the country there have been a 900% increase in COVID positive tests coming in from the border. And then the government takes them, the Biden administration, and puts them on a plane at night and fly them to different states in our country and drop them off and the mayors don't know they're coming. The governors don't know that they're coming and there is no check on their COVID status, whether they're positive or not, and they're being released into the country, therefore making every state a border state, spreading COVID while at the same time saying to the citizens, take the shot. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. If, if right now you injured yourself and you started to bleed, the first thing you would do is stop the bleeding. And I would say, uh, a government, uh, I, I think I trust you more if first and foremost, instead of you trying to twist people's hands uh, twist people's arms and make them do things that you're not supposed to legally be able to do. How about doing something that you can legally do? Close the border. Close the border. Uh, hey, finish the wall. Well, I don't want to finish Trump's wall. What they call it? Biden's wall. I don't care what, whose wall it is. Finish the wall. You don't want to play politics to the point that you jeopardize American citizens because, because uh, you don't want to give credit to someone and acknowledge that it was a good idea. You, you ought to want to win, but you don't want to win that bad. These are conflicting reports. The violence in our streets the looming threat of another shutdown, which have people not knowing. You don't hardly know how to plan. Do I buy this home or don't I? 
Do I buy a new car or don't I? You know, do I make this investment or not? And I'm telling you, we don't need any more checks uh, from the government. There are help wanted signs. Let people go to work. Let people go to work. Y'all not praying for me today. Uh, I want to read something to you that you won't believe. This was sent to me. Uh, people make sure brother wouldn't find out things because they know that if it's credible, we'll talk about it. And I, you know, I'm in a position where I can because I am a registered non-affiliate. I'm not committed to either party. Um, I'm sanctified. And uh, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. You know, already dead. So, you know, when it's like that, you ain't, you ain't got nothing to lose. Just go for it. And then when the Lord gets ready, you got to move. Amen. Just remember I told you. That's the way it works. But listen to this. This was sent to me. I'm not going to tell you her name, nor will I tell you where she is from. Greetings. Now this, when did this take place? August the, this is as of today. This is an announcement going forth in the church today. As you have learned, we, we are blessed in reaching capacity for in-person worship for this Sunday, August the 8th. And registration is closed. And if you have not registered, your participation continues to be important. And we encourage you to join the procession virtually. Registration for next Sunday service is August the 15th. Next Sunday service, August the 15th, will open Monday, August the 9th. So if you want to get it in the church next Sunday, the 9th, you got to register. And we encourage you to register that day to avoid missing the in-person option due to capacity limits. Let me cut to the chase. And it says this, uh, when you plan to attend Sunday worship service in person, you must follow COVID-19 protocols and register each week for the upcoming Sunday. Registration opens on Mondays. Remember, and this is from the senior pastor. And he has a PhD. Uh, remember, senior pastor with a PhD. Remember everyone, including children and guests, must be vaccinated. Wear masks and be healthy to attend in-person worship. Now, all I want to say to this is show me that, these requirements in the Bible. Whatever happened to, you know, Jesus said it, but, but you know, we don't, we don't follow him no more. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer for vaccinate. No, for all men. Is that not what the Bible says? That's what the Bible says. And uh, uh, I guess his PhD have just caused him to overlook altogether. Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. You know, what about the portions of the Bible where Jesus healed people? What about they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? You know, what about hiding in the shadow of the Almighty and dwelling in the secret place? Look at how the world is changing the church. 
the world, and some church members. Because now, I hate to say it, on the flip side, what this man is trying to do, he got this, and I don't know him, but I recognize the language. He has gotten language from a lawyer to protect himself just in case one of the sweet old members of the church who loved the church and loved the pastor with his PhD. You, ain't, you can't see his name from here. Some of y'all straining. Let me try to see who it is. You can't see his name from here. But just in case somebody has x-ray vision. You never know. See, some things we have created We've been sued. We won, of course. But it's amazing what people will do who love the Lord and love the church and just think so much of that church and then they accidentally trip and fall. And all of a sudden, it's the saints' fault. The Bible said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The devil is changing church. Now I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, whatever your status is in terms of whether you're vaccinated or not, that's your business. But ain't nobody going to ask you that at the door coming in here. No, that's not, you know, sir. No, sir. I, now, you want to see the country have a fit? Write a letter and say, we want to know your HIV status before you can come in. Try that. When they get through with that preacher and, and, and with his PhD, when they get through with him, he will, he will never... Uh, try anything like that again. But with something like this, it is, it is unconscionable that a church would make this a requirement. Well, but preacher, people want to live. Oh, the roles are littered. Evangelist Wilborn, the roles are littered. They're packed with Christian evangelists who went to foreign fields to heal people of malaria, to heal, help people of other conditions. And they died in the process. And yet they saved lives. Now here we are. We got to, well, I guess we're special. We got to uh, be guaranteed that nothing can uh, COVID can't touch us at all. Well, what about other things that kill people? Because I think people have forgotten that 150,000 people worldwide died, die every day pre-COVID. And almost 8,000 every day in America pre-COVID. Now, you're blessed that you hadn't made the roll yet. But we're all going to make it sooner or later, one way or the other. Say amen. And so now the churches, you, you're talking about something horrible. You, you are doing this to people and, uh, uh, and requiring them to have to have this before they can enter into the house of God. In this day where we have a new protected class, you know the LBGTQ, that's a new protected class. You can't disagree with them. You can't even watch a ball game. Now, the women's Olympic team won the basketball. We got the gold. But for those who could watch, they make it harder when they got to point out which one of them is married to another person of the same sex. All that to watch a game. That's too much. 
And all that is, that's Satan trying to uh, break your spirit. Show it to you enough where after a while you'll see it and not see it. All them women running around looking like men. Some of them, you interview them, all that bass in the voice. So I guess in the, with, the, with the women's athletes, they don't test for steroids because women don't naturally have voices like that. You can get one, but you got to take some. And all of a sudden, ain't nothing up here. Now either you got to go under the knife or you got to take something to flatten out like that. You just, you know, you, you, just got, you, get, you just got to know what to look for. And they're testing for everything, testing for steroids and all that. But some of those women, they found a way to pass the test. Maybe somebody else pee in the cup for them. But they own it. They own it. Oh, you got, well, how do you know? Look at it. They own it. I'm not calling any names. And then we, I'm going to preach now. And then there is, there is the constant reports. And I'm going to show you what this sermon is all about. The constant reports uh, and we're grappling with BLM. I hope you don't leave. And critical race theory. To the point where there are people literally saying out loud that the cure to past racism is present racism. But if you believe that, then I guess you are going to disbelieve Proverbs 20 and 22, which says, say not thou, I will recompense, that is, I will repay evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Bible said you're not supposed to say, I'm going to get people back for past injustices or past anything, but instead, Wait on the Lord. Look at this. I'm going to show you some passages because you know I didn't write the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, See that none render evil for evil. Unto any man. Now, unto any man covers white man, black man, the Asian man, any man, Hispanic, see that none render evil for evil to any man, but every, but look at this, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves as believers and to all men, the general public, will not to render evil for evil. First Peter. Chapter 3. Oh, and uh, verse 9 says, Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called thereunto. That you are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. So the saints are not supposed to render evil for evil. All right, Romans. Oh my, I want to make sure you get, get this. I want to make sure you see what the Bible says about this. Romans chapter 12 verse 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide all things honest in the sight of all men. And then a passage that we now pretend is not even in the Bible. We pretend that this one's not even in the Bible. And then we pretend not to understand it when we acknowledge that it is in the Bible. And just about nobody preaches from it. But I'm going to read it to you and I know that I'm taking a chance. Somebody might grab their grip and leave. But Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 39 but I say unto you that you uh, well, let me go. Let me go to verse thirty-eight. 
He says, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Pastor, was that really in the Bible? Yes. Yes. Hebrews uh, uh, 12 and 14 says, follow peace with all men. That's the white man, the black man, the Hispanic man, the Asian man, all men. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without no man shall see the Lord. So these people are trying to convince us on the basis of skin tone that it is in our best interest to ignore the Bible and to read and listen to them as they bring up real stories because the country, the history of the country is what it is, but you ought to teach the whole history, but it is what it is. So as we bring up stories, then the cure is, is for us to become what we loathe. And there are churches and pastors who are taking that on and ignoring the scripture. Nothing on earth is better for us than obeying God's word. If disobeying God's word is part of the cure, it's not a real cure. Amen. It's not a real cure. You're better off as a saint who is sick in their body. You're better off to bear your sickness and pray and ask God and take the medicine that the doctor give you. You're better off to obey the doctor, take your medicine, pray and ask God to heal you and all that. Then... If, if it seems like you're not getting well, then for you to go to the root worker. See, because God said he wouldn't suffer a witch to live. So you can't turn to that which the Lord has cursed as a remedy. Y'all don't like my preaching today. I could go on and on. Patriotism now is viewed as a bad thing. Y'all don't hear me. The goal of this teaching is found in verse 11. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you. Have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. It is the will of the Lord that the saints in these last days are joyful. See, follow me now. I'm headed somewhere. It's taken me a minute to get there. But follow me. The media, all of them are in it. They are trying to rob us of our joy. They, they, they report, they don't report even the news. They won't report good news and leave it alone. Oh, it was a beautiful day today. The weather was, com was, uh, was very, very comfortable, but how long will it last? There's always a hook. There's always something to take the edge off. That's, that's the, what do you think this continuous day by day COVID coverage is all about is to keep you keep you down to, you can't breathe you, you can't escape it I turned to ESPN the other day to try to get away from it and lo and behold now the, the, in, the NFL is in a class with some of his players because some of the guys don't want to take the shot and they're trying to put pressure on us. Well, now let me try to turn somewhere else. We're being bombarded. It's a technique. It's, it's, that's actually a technique. It's called jamming. 
That's actually a technique, jamming. Jam. They keep, keep giving it to you, giving it to you. That's what they're doing with LBGTQ. Keep it in the commercials, put it in the movies. Put it. it used to be in the black shows, you know, brothers and you don't really have that. It ain't true now. It's not true now. I mean, you can't even watch the All American. There it is. Jamming, 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 jamming. It's, you know what? It's jammed everywhere but at church. The preachers, you know what they're doing? The jamming has broken their spirits. Now, the prophet Isaiah, are you all following me? The, the prophet Isaiah prophesied, and, and, and I promise you I'm going to preach and, 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 and it's, it's going to get better. But I, but I hope you're getting something out of this. He prophesied of an end time joy. Woo! Isaiah chapter 29. Well, Isaiah chapter 25, chapter 25. Let's look at chapter number 25 of the prophet Isaiah. And uh, I want to call your attention to the ninth verse. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day. Lo, look at this. And it shall be said, excuse me, in that day. Lo, this day is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord and we have waited for him. Look at this. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. He said in the last days, the saints will say, I'm waiting on the Lord. And in waiting on the Lord, the Lord will save us. And we will rejoice and be glad. The prophet goes on to prophesy in chapter 35. Chapter 35 of the prophet uh, uh, Isaiah and verse 10 says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion, look at this, with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's not the will of God for the saints to be all sorrowful. Y'all be careful how we sing all these long, sad songs. Give me some joy up in here. Amen. You don't want all the songs in the service to be slow and dead and all that kind of stuff. There ought to be joy. Joy, somebody shout joy. joy. Amen, joy plays a major role in the work of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse three, he prophesied of an end time joy. Look at this, Isaiah 51 and three says, for the Lord shall comfort Zion, and he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. The saints are to be joyful people. Saints are to be singing people. Amen. The more deeply we enter into a, a loving, obedient union with Jesus, the more full will be our joy. Joy is the unexpected gift growing out of our intimate relationship with Christ. People who have no joy, I question their intimacy with Jesus. For if you have a relationship with Christ, it, it bubbles up on the inside. It can't be hid. And you can tell, you can just sit around and tell just about who has a relationship and who doesn't because those who don't have one are some joy, joyless, pitiful souls. They just sit there in service. Like a knot on a log. They have a natural sky 
on their face. You, you know what I say? Stop watching. Uh, stop watching some of these news shows. Stop watching some of these television shows. Stop letting these people beam in pessimism and negativity all day long. Stuff like that get into your subconscious. And the next thing you know, you're depressed and you don't even know why. The Lord wants you to have joy. Joy for the God of the Bible. He is the one. Christ is the one who we love and serve. And I heard the prophet, I heard the, the builder, the, the master builder, Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 8 and 10, he declared that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Strength there is strength sustainer. Sustainer. Satan knows that if the believer can just keep their joy, joy will sustain you. Joy will keep you. This is why Satan tries so hard oh, to just make you miserable. You got to become discerning. You got to become a technician. You got to know when it's time to tell uh, Susie's sad sack, I got to go. Get off the phone. You're complaining too much. Your, 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 your world is too negative for me. Too much go on. You know what? I get off the phone as fast as I can after I've heard one sad story too many. I want to hear that all the time. Early in the morning, someone wants to start your day going down. Now, from time to time, I'm not saying that you, there's not a place for that, but you can't, you can't have somebody in your life who, they, who, have you ever met people who there's always something wrong? Always, you, to the point where when you see them call you, oh, Lord, oh, I'm not answering. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish listening to this music. I'll call back later, but I want, I, want to, I want to stay up for a minute. Please just let me stay up for a minute. Let me enjoy the goodness of the Lord for a minute before we get on the phone with you. Oh, Pastor, you over exaggerating. Become a pastor. You learn techniques to keep your joy. Because if you don't, next thing you know, I, look, I understand why some preachers drink. Rev, keep him up. <laughs> Amen. He don't have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't understand what Satan is trying to do, next thing you know, hey, while he's drinking it, he'll put his hands on his hip. <laughs> the devil is a liar. And if, and, if, and, if, and if their help is not liquor, it's a girl. See, you got to be careful that you keep your joy. Satan knows that without joy, uh, the devil gains an advantage. Baker said this joy is not, this joy is not mere happiness. He says, but it is a deep, it is a deep tranquility that is free from worry about the affairs of the living and that knows that God's purposes are good. You got to know that whatever is going on, that God's in charge and that the Lord's purposes are good. John 16 and 20, Jesus prophesied about the end time joy. Jesus said this starting at the 21st. Y'all don't mind if I preach the Bible, do you? He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall reap, you shall weep, excuse me, you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and, you, and ye shall be sorrowful, but that ain't all. He says, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Then he gives an example. He says, a woman, when she is in travail, have sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, uh, she remembers no more of the anguish for joy that a man has been born into the world. 
And ye now, therefore, have sorrow. You got sorrow because I told you that I'm leaving. But I will. Uh, ye, uh, I will see you again. And your, and your heart shall rejoice. And your joy, no man, look at this, taketh from you. And in that day, let's see what time was he talking about. In that day you shall ask me nothing. So you won't be able to talk directly to me because in the, pre in the flesh I won't be here. But verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Well, that's this day. Jesus is not here in the present, but we're able to ask the Father in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said in verse 24, hitherto until now have you asked nothing in my name because you could talk directly to me. He says, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And one other thing that's just not, that, that's, that's obvious here, so obvious that you don't see it, but one of the big components of joy, listen up a room, listen my friends who are streaming, one of the big components of joy is prayer. It's prayer. He says you'll ask the Father in my name. That's prayer. Praise the Lord. You're not gonna have joy and not be a prayer warrior. See, some of us, our joy don't last because we don't pray. I want to encourage you to pray. Come out to prayer. Pray in your home. Talk to the Lord. Elders, become prayer warriors. Develop a good prayer habit. Pray. Nothing fulfills you like prayer. Praise the Lord. And uh, uh, Jesus also said in John 17 and verse 3, he said, uh, and now... Uh, come I to thee, and I, and these things I spake, I spake in the world. These things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. It is the will of God that we have joy. Uh, Brother Jeff, I want you to show them, we're going to the text now. I want you to show them slide number one where Jesus said, I am the true vine. Do y'all see slide number one? Now this is right here. This is the true vine. And a great vine, this is that consistent vine right there. From there you see the branches and the leaves. You see it? There's the true vine. There's the branches. There's the leaves. And eventually, there's the fruit. All right? Slide number two, please. Praise the Lord. You see it even better. See, there's the trunk, the true vine. The branches as they offshoot. You see that? You see the sprouts, the shoots, and eventually you see the clusters, the fruit. Same here. Do you see that? The true vine. It's the leaves. Next, please. And then look at look at that. Look at this one. Let me try it on the other side. I don't want to throw away the saints. Look at this. There it is. And there's the true vine. And there are the branches that comes up. There's the leaves. Oh my. Some of the things that need to be pruned away and all that. And eventually there's the fruit. Are you following me? This is what Jesus says when he says, I am the true vine. Now, uh, the, the metaphor, it, Israel, the nation of Israel, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut some of this and uh, uh, go home with this because you, you all are not saying amen. Uh, uh, the nation of Israel was um, the vine. See, the vine metaphor that Jesus is using, I want to give you three things about it. Um, it builds on what we learned about Jesus in chapter 14. Amen. See, the disciples, uh, in chapter 14, he gave them great, he said something to them that gave them great anxiety. And what gave them great anxiety in chapter 14 was what he said in the first verse. He, he told them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And that stems from chapter 13, 
as he told them he was getting ready to leave and he was going to his father's house. So when the anxiety hit them in chapter 14, Jesus gave them a remedy for the anxiety. And the remedy is found in John 14, verse 16 through 18, where the Lord says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it see him not, neither know him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And the Lord says, nevertheless, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come unto you. Verse 26 of that same chapter says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said the cure to having your heart broken uh, that I, I announced that I'm leaving, the cure to it is the Holy Ghost whom I will send in my name. Now, the second thing that I want you to get is that the vine or the vineyard was a metaphor used in the Old Testament. It was used frequently to describe the nation of Israel. Psalms 80, 8 uh, through 11 says, Thou hast brought, brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathens and planted it went into the land of Canaan and God planted it. Thou preparedest room for it and thou caused it to take deep root and uh, filled the land. It filled the land. The hills were covered by with its shadow and borrowed sprouts therefore uh, uh, were like the goodly cedars and she sent out her sprouts unto the sea and her branches unto the rivers. The point of this is that Israel was considered to be God's first vine. And if you read the writings of Ezekiel and the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, Ezekiel 17, one through six, Jeremiah 12, one through 10, you will see that the nation of Israel was God's vine. And then last Sunday from Isaiah chapter five, Verse one through seven, I preached here about how the Lord planted a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, but he expected the vineyard to bring forth grapes. Instead, it brought forth wild grapes. So Israel failed in its mission to be the true vine. And since Israel failed as a nation, Jesus came and said, not the nation of Israel, but me, myself. I am the true vine. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and when Jesus called himself the true vine, this was the eighth I am statement that Jesus gave in the book of John. John 6, chapter 6, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the door to the sheep. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And in chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And in chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here in our text, chapter 15, in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. Israel turned out to be a false vine, producing wild grapes. Christ, as the true vine, bring forth good fruit. Christ is the perfect fulfillment Praise the Lord, thank you Jesus, of all the types and the shadows in the Bible. Rather than claiming to be uh, the vine dresser and assuming divine prerogatives, Jesus says, I'm the vine. So Jesus is the vine and Israel was the vine. Union with Christ is like the union with the new Israel. Attachment to Jesus is the only means of access to God's house. Jesus marks the beginning of the new Israel. 
And in chapter 14, the emphasis was on the Holy Spirit remaining with us. Remember Jesus said in 14 and 16 that he will abide with you forever. But here in chapter 15, the emphasis shifts from the Holy Spirit abiding with us and it shifts to results. Results. Everybody say results. The experience must lead to results. Results are bearing fruit. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that shows no results, that bears no fruit, is cut away. Every branch that bears fruit is pruned. Now the question is, praise the Lord, what is fruit? What, when Jesus speaks of fruit, what is he talking about? Most of the time when we uh, read about fruit, we assume that he's talking about soul winning. But in this context, he's not talking about soul winning. I like what Butler said about fruit. He said fruit is the grace of conduct, of deportment, and attitude. In other words, after you get saved, you ought to change. Praise the Lord. As we walk with Jesus, certain things ought to adjust. Uh, Our attitudes ought to change. Our conduct and behavior ought to change. Now, if you're saved and you're still lying like you were, before you claim salvation, something's wrong. If you're born, you claim to be born again and you still cuss like a sailor, something's wrong. Matter of fact, if you're born again and you cuss at all, something's wrong. Praise the Lord. See, fruit, fruit, but you, you see yourself changing. You, you're saved and 10 years later, you still got the same attitude problem that you had 10 years prior. You still got a bad attitude or you're quick tempered. Something's wrong for fruit causes you to change. How you gonna call yourself saved and you're beating or shoving your wife? Uh, you're a loser. You, fruit causes you to change. You can't just stay there. I'm not getting any help here. When, when, when Jesus gets in you, results take place. And the Lord looks for results. So, so, when you, maybe, maybe, maybe you have a cruel tongue. A cruel way of talking. Maybe there's no grace in your speech. Well, after you've been saved for a while, that ought to change. That's called fruit. Fruit. Every person in here ought to be able to take inventory and show how he or she has changed. And not only that, people ought to be able to tell that you're not the same person that you once were. Oh, I'm not getting any help today. I want you to know a streaming live, my attendance is good. They're just not saying amen. But the saints came out today. And, uh, and but some of us, you know, we just said, well, this is just me. And I, I just talk like this. I'm just like this. Well, well, it may be just you. But once you get Jesus on the inside, once you get Jesus on the inside and the true vine began to work with you, then all of those things are supposed to change. It's called bearing fruit. Uh, praise the Lord. Now, look at what happens when you fail to bear fruit. I got to back up now because I skipped over something very important intentionally. Jesus said, I am the true vine. You got that right? But he said something else that's very important, something that's very necessary for the vineyard to succeed, and that is the work of the vine dresser, the husband man. It's very important. And Jesus said, I'm divine, uh, but my father is the husband man. Uh, yes, sir, my father is the one who does the pruning. He's pruning, uh, and notice this, everybody gets pruned. The father is the husband man. The relationship between the vine and the, and the, and the people Praise the Lord, the relationship between the believer and God is the same as the vine and its owner. The vine, the vineyard, the owner, he tends the vine. He waters it. He endeavors to protect it. 
He cultivates it so that it can produce its maximum yield. I want you to know, upper room, that God is pruning. And notice this, hallelujah, he prunes in two ways. He prunes, first of all, he prunes everybody. Praise the Lord, the scripture says in verse two, every branch, not one, not two, not the good, not the bad, the bad but every branch. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, look at this, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. So you see, uh, regardless to what side you are, there's a purging that takes place. But he said, every branch that beareth not fruit. You see, when a branch is attached to the vine, and if it doesn't bear fruit, it's called dead wood. And you know what you do with dead wood? You cut it away. Now you decide whether or not you're going to be dead wood. And, uh, and if you are, and if you're just not going to grow. And if you're just not going to do right. And if you simply are not going to get with God's program then God has a remedy for you. He's going to cut you away. As a young pastor, I used to always feel bad when someone would leave the church. I'd go on my knees and pray and ask God, Lord, what have I done? God, how did I fail them? God, what went wrong? But I found out that not everybody who leaves leaves because you've done something. Some folk God cut out and God cut off because they ain't nothing but dead wood. They don't want to serve. They're here but all they do is complain. They won't grow and they won't let you grow. And you know what God will do? He'll come in when he gets ready and clip, 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 clip. And there you go with your dead self falling to the ground. And when that dead wood falls to the ground, it ain't good for nothing but to be burned. You don't want to be dead wood. You don't want the Lord to cut you off. But instead, you want to be, hallelujah, that, that, that branch that don't need to be removed, but it does need to be trimmed. Live wood gets trimmed so it can reach its potential of bearing fruit. And sometimes you'll notice that people who used to call you, they don't call you no more. People who used to come to see you, they don't come to see you anymore. People who were in your life, they're not in your life anymore. And you wonder, what have you done? Sometimes it's not that you've done anything, but it's that God came in and pruned them because they were in the way of you reaching your full potential. You can't produce fruit because they won't let you. You can't grow because they keep you filled with gossip. You can't become the person that God wants you to become because they're always trying to pull you into wickedness or into ungodliness. Well, if God looks down and see that your heart is in the right place. He goes to pruning. He goes to cutting. And you find that when you first lost those people, you felt bad about it. But then you find that your anointing went up. You find that your finances went up. You find that your spirituality went up. So it wasn't the devil who took them away. But it was God himself doing some pruning. I'm so glad that the God of the Bible is a pruner. And you ought to lift your hands and just tell the Lord, prune away. Prune away, Lord. 
if there's anybody who needs to be removed, if there's anybody who needs to be taken out of my life so I can reach my full potential. Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gains the world and loses soul? That is what profit have you gained if you gain the world but you never become the individual that Jesus made you to be. You never become the best version of yourself. Oh Lord, I want to become a better version of the person that you saved me to be. Say yeah. Yes. Everybody who wants to get better, say loud. Prune me. Take away everything that's not like God. Say yeah. Ah, yeah. Look, look, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you ought to behave. And I ought to behave where God don't cut us up. Cut us out of each other's life. I don't want to be a stumbling block on occasion to fall in your life. And I don't want you to be mine. And when it comes to God, he is the pruner. And ain't nobody here strong enough to box with God. If the Lord want to remove you, he knows how to do it. If God knows how to take you down, God knows how to take you down. So saints, I want to tell every one of us, let's grow. Let's grow so the Lord will trim us. I don't mind being trimmed. I just don't want to be cut off. I don't mind being trimmed so that I can get better. I just don't want to be cut off. This caring process is a picture of God dealing with human beings. He removes the dead wood from the church. I love a room and I'm more pleased with where we are today than I've been in a long time because God knows how to cut away the dead wood and sin quality. Sin folk who want to be holy. Sin folk who want to be real. Sin folk who are not ashamed of being straight. Sin folk who are not ashamed of being sanctified. And sin folk who are not ashamed of me, the Lord's prisoner. Sin folk who want to shout. Sending folk who want to worship. Lord, keep on purging. Lord, keep on managing. Lord, oh, 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 Lord, keep on doing it. Somebody ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. Point at that neighbor and say, get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Get over what? Get over that broken heart. Get over what? Get over missing that person who don't call you no more. Get over not being with that gossip crowd who don't invite you to their dinners anymore. Get over not being invited to go over there and get your hair cut. Get over. For them leaving you alone. And you've been rebuking the devil. But it wasn't the devil. It was the Lord pruning. Getting them out the way. So that you could flourish. So that you can grow. I'm so glad. I'm glad. That God is able. Somebody shout something. The Lord is. He's able. Do it. Let him prune. Let him cut.
cut away. Somebody tell God thank you. Somebody tell God yeah. Woo! I want to give you just a minute to praise God for his, his pruning and his uh, pruning in your life. Just thank him for it. Just thank him for it. Thank him for it. Let me hear him thank the Lord, Rocky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You removed the dead weight. Thank you. You removed the sad sack. Thank you. You removed, oh God, the hinderers. Thank you. The Bible said, get rid of the scorner and strife will cease. And then what came when you got rid of them? The power of the Holy Ghost. Power to heal. Power to deliver. Power to set free. He gave you your joy back. He gave you your dance back. He gave you your energy back. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. say yes he said you are clean through the word now you're clean through the word that I preach unto you you're clean the word is clean here the word is catharos Greek word is catharos which means clean unspoiled and pure now what's interesting is catharos is the Greek word for the word clean. Katharios is the Greek word for the word purge. So these two words, they basically mean the same thing. He purges, he cuts away the dead wood, but he cleans the sanctified. Hallelujah. I challenge somebody to say to the Lord, clean me up, clean me up. Somebody don't want to be clean. Clean me up. If you don't want to be clean, you ain't got to say anything. But if you want to be clean, ask the Lord, clean me up. Clean me. And then fill me till I won't no more. Can you say yes? Can you say yes? Woo! You're clean. You're clean. We get clean, phone and praise him. You get clean when the word is preached. The word of God condemns sin. The word of God inspires holiness. The word of God promotes growth. The word of God is a cleaning process. It takes away sin. Evil is removed and it gives you power to come forth as pure gold. And all we need to do to continue to produce is to remain in Jesus. Don't you let nobody separate you from the Lord. Grab hold of Jesus. Grab hold of Jesus. Tell the Lord, I'm not going anywhere. Tell the Lord, I'm not going to backslide because it's true without you. Brother Jeff in the sound room, the technician, they didn't know I was going to do this. Brother Jeff, put number three back up. Put slide number three back up. Why are you praising the Lord? Give him a minute. Now, now, now that is. Now that is. There it is right there. Now, let me ask you a question. Now, we're going to shout in just a minute. Now, this is the true vine. Jesus said, take this away. So you take this away, all that's gone. 
Take this away, none of that grows. Take this away, none of that materializes. And that's what the devil knows. Satan knows. Uh, let's go home, Rocky. The devil knows that if he can separate you from Jesus Christ, he knows that he don't have to bother you no more. He knows that he don't have to make you sick. He don't have to come against you because if you get separated from the Lord, you're going to dry up. You're going to dry up. You're going to fade away. That's the reason why this BLM and the critical race theory and all that stuff that's trying to separate us from the Bible. These black Hebrews trying to separate us from the Bible. You ought to, do, you ought to go back. I wish I could bring up Mother Kendall and all them when they would sing songs like I'll let nothing separate me from his love. Hallelujah. Because if you let the devil separate you from Jesus, you are dry up on the vine. But if you stay with the vine, the devil knows that he can't stop you. I'm staying with Jesus. Can I get a witness? I'm going to stay with the Lord. How many are determined today to stand with the true vine? I get my help, I get my power, I get my strength, I get my ability, I get my love, I get my joy, I get running in my feet, clapping in my hand from being with the true vine. The true vine gives me joy in the midst of sorrow. The true vine gives me hope for tomorrow. The true vine has kept us for 64 weeks. The true vine, he's able, he's able to heal your body. The true vine, the true vine, yeah, 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 Lord. Woo! Oh, Lord. Worship the Lord, worship the Lord. Tell him I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. But there's nowhere for me to go. And he promised me that if I stay with him, if I love him, if I abide in him, and if I take the love that he's given me, and if I love you and you love me, he promised that our joy will remain because it's his joy, his joy, his joy, his joy. And I heard him say, the joy that I give you, no man taketh it from you. You ought to tell the devil, you can't take my joy. Oh, you can't take my joy. You can't take my peace. You won't disturb my mind. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Woo! This joy. If we wasn't in COVID, you know I'd have you holding your neighbor's hand. Right now. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Yeah, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Ah, this joy. That I have, the world didn't give it to me. 
I didn't get it from the club. I didn't get it from the ball game. I didn't get it from the Olympics. I didn't get it at the movies. I didn't get it at the ABC store. The world didn't give it. The world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. Yeah, yeah, that's joy. Somebody will praise the Lord that I have. Do I have anybody with joy? The world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy down on the inside. I'm, 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 I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the midst of COVID. I'm talking about in the midst of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I'm talking about in the midst of them just bombarding us. I'm talking about in the midst of a country where it seemed like we're coming apart at the seams. Ah, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Yeah, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Well, now I'm singing this joy that I have. Good God, the world didn't give it to me. <laughs> this joy that I have. Well, now the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have. The world. the movies hey, hey, the world didn't give it the world can't take it away this joy that I had for the last time the world didn't give it to me I'm gonna have joy today this joy that I have can I get a few joyful people the world didn't give it to me to come down here and dance before the Lord this joy now the world didn't give it to me. Hey, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Hey, 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 yeah. I said the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Ah, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. I know, I know. I know. I know. Yeah.